Welcome to our lecture online. Well, the first successful mission to Mars on a flyby was Mariner 4, a small spacecraft with a mass or weight of 525 pounds, an equivalent of 261 kilograms. It was not very big, very small, plus it had to have fuel on board in order to be able to adjust its speed and its direction. And so what else did that spacecraft have on board? And it's actually amazing how many instruments they were able to pack in this very small spacecraft. So let's go through some of it. Notice that it launched November 28, 1964 on an Atlas LV-3 rocket. And its, cl its closest approach on flyby happened on July 15, 1965 at a distance of about 10,000 kilometers from the surface, about 6,000 miles. So notice that it was a fairly small spacecraft and it had two antennas, a high gain and a low gain, in order to save power of whatever could be sent on low gain antennas. It had four solar panels producing a total of 310 watts. That's not a lot of power, but sufficient for whatever was on board of the spacecraft. 310 watts, wow, imagine that. Um, a vacuum cleaner is over 1,000 watts, so it did not have a lot of power. It did have a backup battery. It was a silver zinc battery that, when it was fully charged, and it was a rechargeable battery, holds, holds 1,200 watt hours of power or of energy. 1,200 watt hours. Well, notice that uh, if you have 300 watts running for four hours, that's 1,200 watt hours. So essentially, it contained enough energy, that battery, for four hours of solar power solar panel produced power. Wow, that's a mouthful. So it could produce as much power as the panels for a duration of four hours. Why did we need that battery? Oh, for two reasons. For backup, in case something went wrong and temporarily you didn't get power from the panels, you could run off your battery until you figured out how to correct your panels. And secondly, for maneuvers, because when you started doing maneuvers, the panels may not be pointing directly to the sun. The power you get from the panels will drop and you want to have some backup to get you through those maneuver periods until you can reset the panels back in a position where they get full power from the sun. There was what we call a helium magne magne magnetometer, right? that's a hard word to pronounce, a helium magnetometer, which measures the magnetic fields interplanetary magnetic fields as well as Mars. So for example, as they're flying towards Mars, they're continuously measuring the magnetic fields, and as they got close to Mars, if Mars had a magnetic field, they should have been able to detect it. Since Mars does not have a magnetic field and only has surface magnetism, I don't know how much they were able to measure with that. It also had an ionization chamber which measures charged particle intensity. So you can see as a direct ionization chamber, you can see charged particles entering it could be measured for their intensity. It also has had a trapped radiation detector, so they can then measure the direction and the energy of the radiation coming into the detector. They had a cosmic ray telescope that they would point away from the sun, so they would get what would get uh, cosmic rays coming from space, and they were measuring protons and alpha particles with that. They had a cosmic dust detector to see how much dust there was between here and Mars. Remember, that was the first time a spacecraft had ever left the Earth and flown to another, another planet, so they wanted to know how much dust, dust they would encounter in that travel. It had a television camera which was used to take the pictures, so they would have continuous pictures that was then collected onto magnetic tape, and then it was sent back slowly through communication through the antennas. It also had a Cassegrain telescope with a 1.08 degree field of view that they used on the camera in order to get the best possible pictures they could get. And the solar panels would spread out to about a span of 6.88 meters, that is uh, pretty well 20 feet across. So it was quite a, a big spread of solar panels on that small little spacecraft. What was interesting was they also had 12 cold nitrogen jet uh, gas jets, so whenever they needed to adjust for the attitude, they could fire off those jets, and those jets were placed at the far ends of the solar panels, far away from the center mass of the spacecraft. Now that is much more effective than having the jets on the spacecraft itself, because you have a much bigger moment arm, so when you fire the jets, you can, with a little bit of gas, have much more control of the spacecraft. So putting those at the end of the solar panels was a brilliant idea, and made that a lot more effective. 
meaning you need to carry a lot less of that gas with you in order to do the adjustment. It of course contains three gyros, otherwise you don't know which direction you're going. The three gyros tell you exactly which direction you're going and how you're accelerating through those directions, how you change directions. So the three gyros would give us the information to know exactly how it's oriented in what direction they were going. The radio transmitters was a dual S-band uh, transmitter and uh, I I don't think it should be like that. Maybe I have two transmitters. I'm not sure if I have one or two transmitters. I can't remember. But notice the bit rate, 8 and a third and 33 and a third bits per second. Can you imagine what that is compared to today's rates? Now we're talking about into the billions of bits per second. Here they're dealing with 8 and a third and 33 and a third bits per second. So very slow radio communication. And that's why they have to store any of the pictures on magnetic tape in order to be able to store them and slowly send them back to Earth. The uh, central computer sequencer ran at 38.4 kilohertz and the reason why you need a sequencer like, like an oscillator that can give you very accurate timing so that the timing on board can be uh, set with the timing on Earth so that there would be a very small difference between them and so that you can send correct controls and correct commands to the spacecraft and it would then know when exactly to respond to those commands. And then we had temperature control. It was interesting. They used shields that were highly uh, reflective to keep the sun from heating up the spacecraft so they would always have these uh, reflectors to protect it from the sunlight and blankets that could be moved around. Of course they're not the typical blankets that we use in our bed but blankets that would kind of shield the spacecraft and trying to keep the heat in on the cold side so they realized that they had to deal with very much heat coming from the sun and then the icy cold side of the spacecraft that's facing away from the sun and they need to keep things in somewhat of control temperature wise so that their instrumentation could continue to work. In the extreme conditions of space it's hard to keep this instrumentation going but again they were very successful and they were able to carry out a lot of the experiments that they had planned on doing with Mariner 4. Mariner 4 was a tremendous success uh, for the uh, space, uh, for, the, for NASA and the, the, all the people that worked on this program and got this successfully off the ground and off to Mars. So yes, it was primitive in our standards today but quite amazing of how they had all this instrumentation in a small spacecraft that had a mass of only or a weight of only 525 pounds. So quite remarkable in what they accomplished back in 1965.